Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Ephesians 5, verses 10 through 20, and can be found on page 183 in the New Testament of your pew Bible. And try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it is said, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debasery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart always and for everything giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. Here ends today's holy word of God. May he add his blessing to the hearing, understanding, and acceptance of his most holy word. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Unity and well-being. I guess we can look at that in many different ways within a church. Unity means I guess coming together and getting along. Well being means the same thing is that we continually look out for the well being of each other and the well being of the church. And that means by being honest with each other and caring about each other and showing each other just as we see within scripture and how we see that scripture brings us together in that understanding. You know, back in the nineteen thirties during the depression there was a famous oil field known as Mr. Yates' Pool. And during this time, he was a sheep rancher. He was not making very much money. And he was on, basically, subsidence from the government. And along came this oil company and said, Mr. Yates, could we drill on your land? Because we feel as though there's an oil reserve underneath the ground. So he signed a lease with them and they drew, uh, drilled, they got down about, I guess, 1,100 feet and they found an oil reserve. And I think it pumped like 80,000 barrels a day. And for 30 years, they kept finding oil reserves. Now this was a man, and I'm using this illustration, this was a man that never realized that he was a multi-millionaire because of what was underneath the ground. In our own lives, that sometimes we don't realize that we have an oil reserve also. And that is through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. The moment we become the children of God through faith in Christ, we become ears of God. Ears of God. You know how like your ears of your family? You become ears of your family? Well, we also become ears of God. We become resources of God. Everything we need to live 
a joyous life as Christians is our victory in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now think about that for a moment. Think about how and when we become ears of God. It's through our birth. It's our birthright. The Holy Spirit who lives within us, but many Christians do not know how or understand the resources of the Holy Spirit. As a result, they live their life in spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty. Not knowing or experiencing the great riches and resources that are already theirs through the Holy Spirit. Like Mr. Yates, before the oil discovery, many Christians own but do not possess the riches that are already theirs. So that they might draw upon the vast resources or reservoir of the Holy Spirit, we need to look at some of the things within the Bible and within the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit. How are we filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we receive the Holy Spirit? It is a birthright, and it is yours right to claim. It is your right to claim. Individually, it is your right to claim. The Spirit himself testifies with the Spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are ears, ears of God, and co-ears with Christ. You can find that in Romans 8, 16 and 17. In Romans 8, 16 and 17, it makes it clearly that we are ears with Christ. It says it, it explains it, it gives it to us there. Part of your inheritance is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. As born-again Christians, is your birthright to be filled with the Holy Spirit just as Peter was filled. What have you done with your birthright? That's a simple question. What have you done with your birthright? Have you claimed it? Have you claimed it in your life? Or have you not? Have you thrown it away? Have you sat on it? It's a simple question. Have you claimed it or not? It is a command to be obeyed. Be filled with the Spirit. Right here. Ephesians 5, 18. If we look at it here, within our Bible, Ephesians 5, 18. Be filled. Don't drink too much wine, for many evils lie upon that path. Be filled instead with the Holy Spirit and be controlled by Him. In other words, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not allow others to control you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. For that's what's important. So claim the birthright. It's yours to be claimed. It's nobody else's. It's an individual decision. It's yours. Nobody else's, yours. So how do we claim it? It's an easy, easy decision to claim the birthright. Either you claim it or you don't. No one can claim it for you. It's yours. You know, it's just like when you're earning a grade in school, it's yours. It's nobody else's. It's yours. You earn it. Either you claim it or you don't. It's like anything in life. You earn it. It's just like respect. You earn it or you don't. You claim it or you don't. These are the things that God has been trying to teach us in so many different ways. And how do we claim it? How do we receive it? And the Holy Spirit is something that we need 
to have in our lives. It's something that we need to continually realize that if God is for us, nothing can ever, ever, ever come against us. Now, if we look at this scripture just for a second, I'm going to ask you to look at it for a second, because it talks about so many things, especially in Ephesians. Now, I'm going to go up a little further than Ephesians. I'm going to go up to verse 21. And this is where a lot of times pastors get themselves into trouble. Connie would know this because she had a husband that was a pastor for a lot of years. And it says here, honor Christ by submitting to each other. You wives must submit to your husband's leadership in the same way you must submit to the Lord. Now that's a tough one to swallow sometimes, isn't it? But I'm going to explain it to you. All right? Then it says, for a husband is in charge of his wife in the same way that Christ is in charge of the body of the church. He gave his very life to take care of it and be its savior. So there's a whole bunch of stuff put on this husband. You know, in other words, he's being really slammed. He's saying he really has to be up here, really above. You know, he's not getting out of this easy at all. You know, it's a tough one. And then it further on goes on to say, so you wives must be willingly obey your husband in everything, just as the church obeys Christ. So we as a church must obey the commands of Christ and all that is given to us. And then it goes on, and you husbands show the same kind of love, agape, unconditional love, to your wives as Christ showed to the church when he died for her. So Christ died for the church and died for the people within the church. All the people. So you understand, you following what I'm saying, husbands don't have it easy. Okay? So men, don't think you're skating. Don't think you can go home and tell your wife, all right, do the dishes. Do this, do that, do this. It doesn't work that way. What it's saying is that you need to be the example. You need to do those things. You need to be the example for your wife. Not to be the boss. Because it doesn't work that way. Because remember, Christ was not the boss. Christ led by example. Christ led because he loved. He cared. He showered people with love and devotion. And that's what we need to do. To make holy and clean, washed by baptism in God's word, so that he could give her to himself as a glorious church without a single spot, a wrinkle, or any blemish, being holy without a single fault. That is how his husband should treat their wives, loving them as part of themselves. For since a man and his wife are now one, a man really doing himself a favor and loving himself when he loves his wife. So in other words, A man is going to treat himself correctly, so he has to treat his wife just as he would treat himself. 100%. 200%. I don't care what it is, but he needs to be 100% for his wife. So guys, I don't want to hear it. At all. Not in the least bit. So don't come to me complaining, because I'm not going to hear it. You need to be 100% for your wife, just as Christ was 100% for the church. 100%. And that's what we need to do, continually. And as we do that, we build the church. We build for each other. So frequently I have found over the years that men will step back and let the women take the lead. 
Is that what we should be doing? Is that what Christ did? I'm going to let you think about that. Process it. Think about what we need to do as a church, as believers in Christ, and the way that Christ has showed us to lead, and how we, as unity, together, how we sustain a church, how we sustain each other and grow through the blessings of our Lord and Savior. And it says back here, in verse 14, that is why God says in Scripture, Awake, O sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. And Christ shall give us light. He is the light of the world. We need to receive the light of the world our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we will hear this word of Scripture as the ushers wait upon us for this morning's offering. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ said, it is much more blessed to give than to receive. <laughs>